Should we get started? Okay, so it's time. All right, so, so um, ever since the release of ChatGPT, uh, November 2022, our tech industry has going through this you know, explosive growth and excitement about Gen AI. And um, we're moving so fast. And um, so bec um, last year, the biggest debate was open versus close. Which one is more viable? Which one is more secure? And which one you know, has the performance that's required by enterprise? But with the LAMA 3.1405B released, and then also over 1 million um, open source models and data sets published on um, Hugging Face, it's pretty much safe to say open source AI is going to stay. And um, so today I'm going to talk about generative AI comments and, um, and what we do there. And this is a community that was created to help foster the innovation and advancement of generative AI via open source and open science. And um, so I'm, today I'm gonna introduce that organization. By the way, how many people have not heard of generative AI commons? Not, not, uh, well, I should have heard of generative AI commons. <laughs> okay, but anyway, but, well, I'm not seeing a lot of participation from the European community. So that's why I'm giving this talk here. Okay, um, so, so we created this uh, generative AI commons um, about a year ago, and it was created to advance the, you know, the innovation of ge um, generative AI via open source and uh, open science. It is um, thought leadership, um, you know, platform. So if you have any ideas, any um, thought um, ideas and uh, thought leadership in generative AI, this is a place where you can express uh, your ideas. And it is also a collaboration platform where you can, you know, we can host and help socialize, incubate your open source projects in the generative AI space. And it is an open membership. In other words, um, anybody can participate and contribute. And when we say open membership, that means you don't have to work for a company that's part of the Linux Foundation. Anybody in the world can participate and contribute. And this is why we have actually a lot of um, researchers from the academic um, institutions. Later, I'll talk about some of the projects with their support. And I do think that you know the generative AI, um, open source generative AI community is different from the traditional open source community. And it's no longer just developers. We also need data scientists, researchers. And also, if you want to talk about really building a, a generative AI, model or a system that is truly unbiased, truly aligned with um, social needs, then we also need to involve, you know, social scientists, psychologists, and policy makers. And so the community, the composition of community is a little bit different, ideally. Um, hopefully we can build a community that is truly inclusive and diverse. So currently we have four work streams, as you can see here. Um, first one is called mad work stream. It doesn't mean people who work there are mad. <laughs> and it is uh, um, you know, acronym of three words, models, application, and data. So this work stream, we work, we're currently working on building a landscape in generative AI. And with the landscape, hopefully we can um, find the, identify the open source solutions. You do see a lot of closed source solutions out there in the generative AI space. But we do think that there's also a lot of open source solutions out there. But the information is kind of scattered. So this work stream is our goal to create a landscape and solution reference architecture so um, everybody can use the open source solutions and stand up uh, you know, generative AI solutions quickly and safely. And um, we have a, a framework work stream. You probably have heard of model openness framework and uh, MOF. It's our um, effort to combat open washing. Uh, later, I'm going to go into it more in detail. And we've been working on that for uh, months. Um, and it's not perfect, but so far, it's been getting really good feedback from model producers as well as model users. And the third work stream is education outreach. This is where, you know, if you're a true beginner in Gen AI, you know, that is a work stream, you know, you, you can definitely benefit from. We do a lot of education material. We have, um, you know, we do a glossary. We publish a glossary. We do a lot of webinars, a lot of um, white papers. And this is a place where you can learn, contribute, and also promote Gen AI. 
And the last but not least, Workstream is called Responsible AI Workstream. As you know, as, while we're moving so fast in advancing generative AI, it's also important for us to be conscientious about you know, the, uh, producing the technology, advancing the technology in a responsible way. And this Workstream is where we're gonna define responsible AI and then also try to uncover open source solutions that help us build generative AI responsibly. Okay, first, uh, let me just dive into uh, framework work stream. And like I said, the biggest, uh, the most high value, you know, output we produce um, from generative AI commons is MOF, Model Openness Framework. And with that, there's also a tool called Model Openness Tool. So first, um, you know, I want to, before I get into that, I want to say, why is it important to embrace openness in Gen AI? Obviously, we all know the benefits of open source, right? Uh, you can enlist everybody in the world to help to help contribute and build your open source projects. Um, and then you can democratize access and promote transparency and help accelerate learning. But for AI, Gen AI more specifically, uh, open source a Gen AI solution can help um, increase, promote ethical AI because if it's not open, then you don't know what's, what kind of data people are using, uh, the model producers are using. Maybe the data could be biased or it, the data is not diverse enough. And so openness in AI can help us navigate um, risks of bias and also um, promote ethical AI and, and um, increase trust and adoption. Um, however, there's a lot of open washing going on. When people say open washing, that means a lot of you know model producers, sometimes consciously or unconsciously, they think they are producing open sourced model. And but in reality, if you look at the licenses they are using, the licenses are not really exactly um, meeting what we call the you know the four freedom of uh, open source that's defined by OSI. So in other words, you know. Uh, when we release open source software, we want to give people the freedom to learn, to modify, to distribute, and um, and and. But um, sometimes, when open source models, uh, to producers when they release an open source model, but if you look at their license, clearly they make some changes. There's some restrictions. So whenever there's some restrictions, it, then the licenses are not meeting the OSI. Uh, approved licenses, then in that case, it's not truly open. So we see that problem, and um, in order to combat that, we came up with a model openness framework. So this year, we um, a bunch of um, researchers and you know open source experts got together. We have um, a professor from um, Columbia University, and also we have a researcher, Kalen, you probably know him, he's from Oxford, and then uh, some people um, from generative AI commons. And they got together, came up with this white paper, and it's, um, it's a concept, it's a thought leadership, and the paper has been well received. So basically in the paper, it says, you know, we, we look at the 16 components of generative AI model, and we identify the 16 components. Um, under code, there's an evaluation code, pre-processing code, model architecture, libraries, tools, training code, and inference code. And under data, this data set, evaluation data, sample model outputs, model weights, parameters, model metadata, and configuration files. And then documentation, there's you know, technical report, model card, data card, evaluation results, research papers, et cetera. So we identify this 16 components. And so what we are doing is um, we, look at, we look for these components and see if there's any license attached to it. And so first, it needs to have a license attached to it. Secondly, it needs to have a correct license. So when we say correct license, that means we only acknowledge or accept OSI approved licenses. That's you know Apache, MIT, BSD, et cetera. And for instructional content, we, uh, we're looking for um, CCBY, the com uh, CCBY licenses. For structured content, we're looking for um, CDLA, which is a Linux Foundation's um, community data license. And um, so basically what we're saying is, okay, if you said your model is truly open, then we're looking at these 16 components and each component you need to have the correct license. And with that information, we categorize or classify the model into three uh, classes. The basic model, the basic class is called open model. And that means 
um, model architecture, model parameters and weights, technical reports, evaluation results, model card, data card, and sample model outputs are available with, and with the correct license. And the second class is what we call open tooling, is class three plus training code, inference code, evaluation code, and evaluation data, and supporting libraries and tools. And all the information has to have the correct license. It uh, has to be available with the correct license. And class one is the ultimate class. That means um, open science. And for those people who are from the academic world, you're familiar with open science. It's a very, it's a common practice for academic research. It means everything's open. So it's class three plus class two plus open research paper, open data sets, open um, pre-processing, model parameters, model metadata, uh, and et cetera. So, um, so ideally, you know, we like to, you know, open source models. Um, we like to push people, well, encourage people to move to class one open science, but we understand that it's not realistic because sometimes for, um, you know, competitiveness or um, for uh, sometimes it's privacy reason, data privacy reasons, you just can't open everything. And we understand that the world is not so black and white, especially when it comes to AI. It's, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you attended the previous session, uh, OSI is trying to define open source AI. It is very challenging and it's not, the world, especially today is not black and white, it's not zero or one. A lot of times, you know, model producers, sometimes there's a business reason to, you know, to open certain components and not open certain things. And we're not saying which one is right and wrong, but we just think that there's a various business case for um, class, different classes of um, open models. And in that sense, we think this is very more practical. And um, we actually work with OSI uh, and um, the way they actually took the components definition from us and then they are trying to build the open source definition for AI. But what we are offering today is, you know, if you are a model producer, you're saying you are open. Now with MOF, we're giving you the opportunity to be totally transparent about how open you are. And this is beneficial for model users because now you know what you're getting, right? Instead of just trusting them saying, oh, we are, we are you know, embracing open model but you want to know exactly how open uh, the model is. And, and we created this tool called is it open.ai. You can go to that website. And basically it's a tool that takes the license information from the model producer and then, um, and then you'll generate a badge to that classify um, what class the model is. And so here, this is where you submit a model. So this is a self-disclosed um, system and it's an honor system. It's almost like Wikipedia, right? You, you know, you input the, you put in your information about your model and but um, the community can, you know, if you don't do it correctly, the community can complain saying this is not correct, right? Can, um, you know, pr uh, give you feedback. But basically we're trusting the model producers to give their license information via this tool. And then, um, and then the tool is gonna generate um, the class. So here you have a, just an example of, you know, all these models and what class they fit in based on the information they input into this, the is it open dot, is it, uh, op, um, is it uh, open dot AI. So um, it's not perfect. I'm just gonna disclose that it's not perfect. We, uh, but we're on the right track. And currently we're trying to, um, so, so we built the tool based on the white paper. And, um, but at the generative AI comments, we are uh, working on creating a spec, which is more uh, stringent. It's gonna require more reviews and stuff. So we'd like to welcome you to help us gen uh, you know, join our effort. I have uh, my vice chair of generative AI, uh, Arno, from, um, he's you know, leading that effort. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's a really important work. Uh, we have work, talked to a lot of model producers. They, their feedback is, oh my God, it's great you guys are doing this, but it is very hard to do. <laughs> so it is hard to do, but it doesn't mean it cannot be done. So I'd like to you know, uh, welcome you to come and join us, um, the, join us with that effort. 
So the second high value deliverable that um, generative AI Commons is working on is called, uh, is called Responsible AI Framework. And this is where we are defining um, the responsible AI. I know a lot of companies have their own definition of responsible AI, but we think that for open source community, we should have a, you know, a definition that's being agreed on by the open source community. And why is it important to have that definition is, so we, when we have the, uh, you know, come, uh, when we have a definition that we all support, we all agree on, then we have the same language, then we can build our solutions and open source projects based on that framework. And also you'll build trust between, you know, the users and also the society. And hopefully this work can be leveraged by uh, regulatory and, you know, policy makers when they create guidelines. So we have identified uh, the eight dimensions for, um, on, for a responsible AI, human-centered and aligned, accessible and reliable, uh, uh, transparent and explainable accountability, uh, privacy, security, compliant, and controllable, ethical, inclusive, and sustainable. And you probably have read a lot about responsible AI. So what we did was we kind of, you know, took a lot of information from everywhere, and then we kind of just uh, summarized that um, into these eight dimensions. Uh, by the way, we're doing this work with professor, a professor from wa uh, wa uh, University of Washington. He's leading this effort. We're in the process of, you know, completing this white paper, and hopefully after we finish this white paper, we can identify some of the open source projects that meet the challenges of each category. And um, again, I'm giving you a sneak preview of our you know, final work. So um, it's not final yet. Again, you know, we would like to um, enlist you to join us and um, it is community work. So the more people who can join, the, more, the better the, you know, the work will, the output will be. So uh, I'm just gonna, for the next few minutes, I'm just gonna go through each one of them and identify, well, first, you know, um, uh, tell, uh, explain the definition of each dim dimension and identify the challenge of, uh, challenges for each dimension and potential solutions to meet those challenges. Okay, the first one is um, when you build an uh, AI system, it needs to be human-centered aligned. So the AI system needs to, you know, um, meet needs to be human need to be rooted in human values and societal needs and we don't want the AI system to go and go off on its own right it should ultimately serve the human values and societal needs and the challenge is what's human values and societal needs who can really define that I mean especially we're talking about the big world not just you know, Silicon Valley or Europe only, right? We're talking about the entire world. So the human values, um, in order to really be inclusive, uh, to really define it correctly, we need to be inclusive. We need to involve people from everywhere, not just, you know, the Western world. So we need to engage diverse stakeholders in the design and development of the AI system. And also not just developers, we also need to, like I mentioned earlier, you know, in order to make sure the AI system we're creating is um, really aligned with human values and societal needs, we probably need to involve people outside of the tech community, like the so, uh, you know, social scientists, psychologists, and you know, policy makers, and um, other people from other uh, um, industries involved. So the more diverse, the more inclusive our AI system can be more um, human-centered and aligned. And also we need to balance AI autonomy with human control. And, um, you know, we, we don't want the AI system that go, you know, rogue and then we can't control it. So just like, um, you know, the automatic, uh, you know, pilots, right? And you wanna make sure that if there's something wrong with the computer system, then the human can intervene. And that, and you know, in, and then also we probably need to develop guidelines and standards for human-centered AI system designs. Um, a lot of um, companies who are making AI models actually have an alignment department or a group or, or focus. And it's very important to make sure that we're not just going fast, but we are also going you know, forward um, responsibly. 
the second thing it mentioned is uh, accessible and reliable. So we want to make sure that AI system can be created um, that's accessible to all segments of society in the world. And before AI, we know there's already a digital divide between you know, the haves and the have-nots. Earlier, I attended this session about Africa, you know, open source in Africa. And obviously, you know, their resources availability is not the same as what we have in, you know, Western world. And there's a digital divide there. And with AI, the digital divide is going to get worse. Um, I attended this UN event, um, Ospos for Good, um, hosted by UN a couple months ago. That's exactly what they talked about. You know, moving forward, which when we build AI systems, we want to make sure that we are also include we are also including those regions who do not have who do not have the kind of access that we have um, in the Western world. So the solution is definitely we need to build awareness, and also when we build AI systems, we probably need to think about supporting languages. And we're not just talking about just you know regular languages, but sometimes dialects, right? Because language represents a culture. If you're missing a language, you are probably missing that culture. So the more inclusive we can include um, the, in the language support of AI systems, the more the AI systems is more um, you know unbiased and fair. And and also we need to invest in infrastructure to make sure that you know the infrastructure is reliable. So it's not just you know that AI software is available, but infrastructure needs to be uh, reliable to all regions of the world. And and um, and then maybe we can create new monitor system to improve to make sure that we ensure reliability. The third dimension is transparent and explainable. Um, I hosted. Um, uh, the role of a uh, the role of data uh, for Gen AI webinar um, last Thursday, and um, so I had three experts in the data space, and one expert actually said, you know, wh I asked her what is what do you consider a quality data for Gen AI, and she said, explainability. You need to make sure that the data you're using to train your AI can you know can help you with the explainability, repeatability of your AI systems. So, um, so it is a hard problem, you know, especially a lot of advanced AI systems are not intellectible, but it doesn't mean it cannot be done. And also we need to keep, you know, striving for that. So transparency and explainability are very important um, in the, to the success of responsible AI. And, um, you know, maybe uh, the way to um, tackle that problem, that challenges, you know, open source, right? Openness. We want to promote openness, and like the MOF model openness framework that we created at, um, from generative AIs. And I know Stanford has this transparency index effort as well. Um, is also another attempt to show transparency and explainability in AI and OSS, open source AI definition, all these efforts, they're not competitive. They're actually, sh they're trying to do this, you know, to achieve the same goal. When we build AI system, we want to make sure that people are thinking about transparency and explain explainability. And then maybe um, regulatory frameworks, you know, can be created to mandate transparency of the systems. The fourth dimension is accountability. So AI, um, we sh um, there should be clear mechanism for assigning responsibility and accountability for the actions and decisions of AI system. It is very hard to do, just like transparency is very hard to do. It, it is very difficult in tracing decision making. This is why in Europe, the AI Act, right? Um, I t attended this panel discussion about, you know, the current state, in, uh, open source state in Europe and they talked about AI Act. People read it many times, still couldn't understand it. Or, you know, the policymakers couldn't really, they just could not get it to a perfect, you know, uh, state that's being agreed by the community as well as the enterprise. It is a very hard problem, um, but it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't mean, you know, we can't do it. And um, maybe a way to, you know, combat that is we can implement comprehensive documentation and audit trails. And also um, from a legal ethical, create, maybe we can establish legal and ethical frameworks for accountability. And I, I'm a big supporter of carrot, not stick. 
I think if we can foster a culture of responsibility and ethical awareness in our AI open source AI community, and you know it becomes part of our DNA when we make uh, create open source projects in AI, and you know um, policymakers are, are are going to create policies and laws and regulations um, in this space, and um, they might be behind, and you know some might be. Practical, some might not be practical. It's still a long haul, but I do think for our community, maybe creating that culture of responsibility is uh, very important. And the next dimension is privacy and security. And this one, you know, has always been around. You know, for as long as we have technology, and then open source, you know, security is a big topic in this week uh, at a lot of open source conferences as well. But when it comes to AI, it takes it to the next level, obviously. And the risk of data breaches and an authorized access to sensitive information. So we need to balance, and then also balancing the need of data access with privacy concerns. And you know the solutions such as encryption, access control, privacy by design principles. And for AI, a lot of companies um, implement red team and blue team to help and um, you know, all these efforts are necessary to ensure that we address the privacy of individuals and the security of AI system. The next dimension is compliant and controllable. And like I said, policymakers, they realize that, you know, AI is huge. This is transformative and they need to get ahead of the game. So um, they are coming out with laws and um, in US there's, you know, um, US is actually is really supportive of open source AI. So the policymakers are not touching us, but they are creating, you know, um, some regulations around AI policies and Europe, there's an AI act in Asia, in China, there's various AI policies. And the challenge is, all these policies, number one, they are not, not written by us, you know, technical people, they are written by policymakers and lawyers, and sometimes we don't really understand their language, they don't understand our language. So understanding the policy is one problem, and keeping up with the policies is another problem. So that's a challenge. And um, earlier I also attended this session about IP and, you know, relationship about IP management and policy and open source. And I think in the end of the day, you know, what the AI, um, AI community, open source community, like I said, the composition of AI open source community is different from the traditional open source community. I think the policy makers or the lawyers, the IP lawyers, they will play an even bigger role in our projects. So we should keep them informed, also, you know, have a closer working relationship with them. And amongst them, they probably should have some sort of a support group. Um, so they can help each other, you know, the, the legal, your legal teams from your companies. And we want to make sure that, you know, AI system remain under human control. Again, we don't want our AI systems to go to get to a point that we can't control them. So um, this is something that maybe regular compliance audit and risk assessment need to be implemented. And the next dimension is ethical and inclusive. And this has a lot to do with bias. You know, managing bias, we want to make sure that um, the AI system we build is, does not have bias. I mean, most of the data out there on the internet has bias, right? And a lot of model producers are doing this common, you know, crawl, they crawl the internet. And if the internet is already biased, and then the AI system they're building is going to be even more biased. And this is something that we need to be aware of. And, you know, the solution is we need to be conscientious about that and then be more inclusive and get more people involved. And again, I want to stress that generative AI comments, um, even though we, we've been around for about a year, but um, I have to say we still do not have a lot of Europeans participation and you know, Asia Pacific's participation. We have a ton of participation from uh, US. So I'd like to encourage you to check it out. We have our meetings in early mornings you know, Pacific Standard Time. That means it's about afternoon European time. And I like to encourage you guys to get involved so we can build uh, AI solutions that's more inclusive. 
And, and so, and then it's important to be, you know, balance eth ethical considerations with um, practical implementation. Okay, last but not least, sustainability. You, you all know that, you know, training AI systems can eat up a ton of compute resources. And, and we need, it's, it's a problem that we need to think, work together to think about. And so maybe we can develop more energy efficient algorithms to help with the, you know, carbon, um, uh, the, to help with the energy resources. Uh, re maybe we can invest in renewable energy sources for data centers and just to help us reduce carbon footprints. Um, and Linux Foundation is a green software foundation and that, you know, that is the project they are working on solutions like that. Um, yeah, so it's definitely something that we need to think about when we, you know, create our AI sys, um, projects or when we work on our AI projects. The next work stream is education and outreach. I mentioned about this earlier. It's a very exciting work stream. They have a lot of, you know, interesting work that's going on right now. It's probably our biggest, uh, most attended work stream. And, um, and like I said, if you are a Gen AI beginner, this is a place where you're gonna feel you can learn a lot from. And, and then you don't really need to have any background to you know, participate and hopefully you can contribute uh, you know, when you are ready. So we, could, we have this website and anything you want, there's a ton of resources on this website, generative AI, genaicommons.org. And you'll see a lot of white papers, we produce blogs, um, um, like glossary, we published the, we published the AI glossaries of terms. And again, you know, if you have a new term or your company is working on some new term in the Gen AI space, we welcome you to add your term to this glossary. And um, the next project we are working on is is a research project. Um, actually, I'm driving that. Um, it's the research. The focus is to find out, you know, uh, from AI producer, Gen AI produ model producers why they decide to open specific components and not open some other components. Uh, I, you know, I think it would be interesting to really understand. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes they think they are open, but not really, it's unconscious, right? Um, we talked to this model producer, I don't want to name name. Basically he said, oh yeah, we're totally open. We have nothing, you know, we want to open everything. So what we did is we put everything on GitHub and we put Apache license, that's it, for everything. <laughs> and we know that doesn't really work because some of the components are not source code and Apache license only works for source code, but not for, you know, data, right? So um, the data scientists, they are not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, expert in open source. And so we need to bridge that gap, right? And so, so sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes they, you know, like, um, and one model, I don't want to name name, it, they support open weights, but they don't want to open data for competitive reason or for, you know, you know, privacy, data privacy reason. So I just want to understand that. So I created this um, um, open strategies for generative AI research effort. And, um, and then also I want to understand from model user's perspective, from an enterprise perspective, or from a AI application developer perspective, you know, what's your requirement in terms of openness, right? You know, maybe, and, and then this is very interesting, we interview all these, you know, uh, AI models, and producers and users, and, and then some of the AI users, especially enterprise, they said, Oh, you know, it depends on the use case. Some, our R&D department, maybe they require everything to be open. They want to see the data as well. But for a call center, we might not need to, you know, a black box is okay. So um, it really depends on use case. So the, this research, hopefully what we can get to is to find out what kind of use cases require complete openness, um, you know, open science level, what kind of use cases require maybe open tooling level or open you know, model level. So, um, so this is what this research is about. And we're doing it with several researchers and uh, professors from Tulane University, University of Washington, Northeastern University, and Chicago, University of Chicago. And, um, and then you know, um, folks from Generative AI Commons. 
And um, so we're doing it very formally. We have primary research, secondary research. Um, for primary research, we interview several um, AI experts. And then, and then the next step is we are trying to create a, a quantitative survey. We're trying to create a survey form and interview hopefully, you know, uh, with over 300 respondents. And then oh, we'll supplement the, the research with uh, secondary research. And it's a lot of work, but I do think that the output is going to be valuable to people. So the output eventually is going to be a white paper. And then this is where um, also, you know, if, if you are looking for uh, like something to, you know, watch um, on regular basis, a quarterly basis, I host this, um, the webinar, Generative AI Commons, on behalf of Generative AI Commons. And the first one is called um, The Importance of Openness in Gen AI. And the second one I just hosted last week is called The Role of Data in Gen AI. You can get the recording from um, LFAI and Data um, YouTube channel. And um, it's very interesting. The thing is, these webinars are very interesting because we're interviewing people who are in the trenches. And the information you get are the, you know, real time, time information. They are not, sometimes the blogs that could be outdated as you know how fast generative AI is moving. But um, the webinars is very interesting in, because they come from, you know, the people who are in the trenches. So I highly recommend you know, checking out those webinars. And then also um, I host this bi-weekly um, call, um, generative AI comments call. And one feature we included is to, uh, to have a guest speaker from the industry, from the community um, to come and speak. And this is very, um, I do think that this is very interesting. Again, you know, we're talking, what we're trying to do is get the real time information for our community. So having these speakers come and talk about what they do, um, you know, this, the project might not be hosted at Linux Foundation, but it's just something interesting. For example, a month ago, we had um, Shane from MIT and Stanford. He works for both universities. And he came over to talk about his transparency index and also um, data providence initiative. And it was a very, you know, very um, good, a very good, um, uh, call uh, talk. Uh, he got a lot of questions, and then this week at this week's generative ad comments, we're gonna have um, Alan, um, an expert from Alan Turing Institute to talk about trust, their trust platform, and um, Christopher Byrne. So as you can see, this is the pipeline. We're trying to make sure that every generative ad comments biweekly call we have a really interesting guest speaker. So again, you know. Um, Try to get, um, you know, uh, find out about the call and then uh, join the call. You don't have to say anything, just go listen and that's how you s can get, you know, your feet wet. Um, okay, so community engagement and community building are very important. And Gen AI, like I said, the composition of Gen AI community is very, is a little different from the traditional open source community. And um, we are trying to expand our community to make sure that it's more diverse and then, you know, we have experts from everywhere. This is why we have guest speakers and, and then that's why we have an open membership and anybody can come and, you know, listen and learn and hopefully participate and contribute. So we do that via, you know, uh, publishing research papers, blogs. We have AI Dev. We hosted AI Dev US in Seattle, AI Dev Hong Kong last um, a few weeks ago, and then AI Dev Paris, and um, next one is AI Dev um, Tokyo in November. So I highly recommend you join those events, and um, you can, you know, talk to the speakers who are working um, um, on the AI, on Gen AI projects. So um, in addition, we have webinars, demo, fire chats. Um, go, just go to the website; you will get a lot of information there. And, and please fill out this survey. Bring out your phone, take a picture. Okay, currently we're uh, doing a survey on Gen AI. Um, um, we're trying to understand the deployment, use, and challenges of Gen AI technologies and organizations and the role of open source in this domain. And the more you know, respondents we have, 
the better our survey output will be. So this is a way for you to help us out, and we are helping you out as well. Because we want to really get a really good output, then that means the more participants, the better. Okay, that's it. Um, please join us. All right, I have a few minutes for questions, so any question I can answer. All right, does that mean you are going to join Gen AI Commons? It's free. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.